Hey, Drew, Mike Parks, how you doing? I'm doing great, well, sir. Good to see you. It's great to see you, and I just want to make sure your running mate, Sean, is up. Oh, there he is. He just popped up. Well, it's great to have both of you. Uh, Drew, I'm a little concerned about the company you're keeping these days. Yeah, gotta, I gotta know. Watch these guys. Keep a hand on the wallet. Guys. <laughs> But uh, you got some great folks in your uh, with uh, the Seabold and Associates, some good folks. I see John Binghamton regularly. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so listen, I, I won't take, steal any of your guys' thunder. We've got uh, Sean Malone and uh, Drew Tucci, both uh, distinguished in their in their fields. It's great to have both of you uh, gentlemen here, and I appreciate you jumping in and filling in for uh, Kevin Clement, who. Uh, was unavoidably uh, taken away from this opportunity. I know he was looking forward to it. So really appreciate you guys jumping in to um, to help us with the, the student poster presentations. So it's all about those things, not about us. I'll turn it over to you guys and uh, we'll look forward to having everybody back uh, in an hour to have our final panel of this just incredible uh, first time ever virtual Maritime Risk Symposium. So I'll turn it over to you gentlemen. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Admiral. Well, if everybody's online, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the panel hosting the 2020 Maritime Risk Symposium's Research Poster Competition. So I'm Drew Tucci, formerly of the Coast Guard, and my co-host is Sean Malone, formerly of the United States Navy. This year, we had 40 individuals and teams participate in the poster competition, which was outstanding. In fact, our, our big challenge was sort of dividing up all among the posters, who got to judge what posters, who got to see which, and, and how to how to evaluate them. Um, so our judges all commented on the you know very impressive quality of the work shown by the participants, and uh, my my thanks to all of the participants uh, for your hard work. So this afternoon uh, we're going to hear presentations by the top three poster submissions, and we'll hold off for now on who they are, uh, but you're going to enjoy every one of them. But before we get to the poster uh, presenters, I just want to thank uh, the chair, Kevin Clement, um, of the University of Houston, and uh, we'll be seeing more of him in the Maritime Risk Symposium world. And he organized and led our esteemed panel of judges, all right? And let me briefly list them. So we had Scott Blau of Tiffin University, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Earle, the U.S. Coast Guard, Michael Edgerton, Manager of Port Security, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Commander Kate Higgins-Bloom of the United States Coast Guard, John Hummel, Argonne National Labs, Sean Malone, of course, my, my colleague, Dr. David Nickel, University of Illinois, Dr. Fred Roberts, Rutgers University and Cicada, Scott Savitz of the Rand Corporation, Jason Rowe up there in the Great Land, University of Alaska, Anchorage, and Dr. Gabriel Weaver, University of Illinois. So on behalf of the entire Maritime Risk Symposium, thank you to all the judges for your time and expertise in assessing the student research projects. I also want to take the opportunity now to thank some of the folks that were behind the scene, not only for the poster presentation, but for all of the Maritime Risk Symposium. So Katie Balch and Michael Miller. And in particular, I want to really thank Andrea Weitzel. Um, she's been a driving force behind this. And if we were in a live presentation right now, I know what would be happening. And that is everybody would be standing up and giving her a standing ovation for the hard work she has done. Uh, she has pulled this off. Uh, it has been so professional, technically uh, uh, flawless. Uh, you would have think we've been rehearsing for this for years and had done this a dozen times. So, uh, Andrea, thank you for all of your work. Uh, and the other thing that would be happening right now is your boss will be standing up and saying that, you know, he's going to give you a great big raise from this point forward. So uh, th thanks to you. Uh, Sean, I'll, I'll uh, pass it over to you right now uh, to list our, our top 10. Thanks, Drew. Uh, yesterday we announced our uh, top 10 entries. And uh, as you all know, we should be incredibly proud of the work that you've done, your teams have done, uh, and the work of your mentors. Announced in no particular order, uh, the top 10 entries are Cyber Risk Assessment on Maritime Shipping. This was submitted by Grace Miguel, Nisi Patel, Trey Robertson, and Sebastian Shurian of the Maritime Security Center, Stevens Institute of Technology. The Paratus Institute, utilizing strategic foresight to create resilience in the maritime enterprise. Submitted by Petty Officer First Class Marcus Matthews, U.S. Navy, uh, 
uh, and he's associated with the American Military in, uh, University. Development of a handheld sulfur emission detection device for U.S. Coast Guard Marine inspectors, submitted by Satesh Ramnath, Ihar Muradov, Christine Wang, and Amar Bindra. Uh, erosion of port operations, the impacts of coastal wetland resilience on the maritime industry in Rhode Island, submitted by Cadet Madeline Collar and Cadet Anna Kemble Cook, United States Coast Guard Academy. Blue Rov, efficient deployment and monitoring of an underwater robot, submitted by Anton, Anton Delanco, Christina Sonata, Daniel Zatko, and Trent Berrien. Stevens Institute of Technology. Institutionalizing resilience, insights from assessment initiatives at seaports, submitted by Ellis Collegian, University of Rhode Island. Advancing the state of maritime cybersecurity guidelines, submitted by Logan Drazovich, Leon Brew, and Susan Wetzel. And these are all from the Stevens Institute of Technology. And our last two, uh, COVID-19, challenging maritime resilience and the industry's struggle to adapt, submitted by Logan Drazovich, Liam Brew, and Susan Wetzel. Uh, and finally, expanding optical sensors to remotely detect petrogenic dissolved matter in the Arctic, submitted by Catherine Humple, David Pajorski, Phoebe Zito, Elizabeth Wiesenhart, and Patrick Tonko. This team is comprised of researchers from the University of New Orleans, and the University of uh, Alaska Anchorage. Again, uh, thanks everybody for your submissions. Uh, they were truly outstanding. Um, oh, I'm sorry, one last one uh, clipped through on, on my page. Uh, predictive Analytics and Risk Management Dashboard. Uh, this was submitted by Gil and Gerard Austria, Amy Asijam, Connor Smith, and Timothy Steven uh, from Boston University and the Maritime Security Center, Stevens Institute of Technology. Drew, back over to you. All right. So. The top three entries, and this is not in any particular order, we're gonna announce that just a little bit later in, in the show here, but the top three entries, Advancing the State of Maritime Cybersecurity Guidelines by Logan Drasovich, Liam Brew, and Suzanne Wetzel of Stevens Institute. Development of a handheld sulfur emission detection device for Coast Guard Marine Inspectors by Statish Ramnath, Edhar Murdov, Christine Huang, and Amar Bindra. Uh, they're from City College in New York and the Stevens Institute of Technology. And finally, Cyber Risk Assessment on Maritime Shipping, uh, submitted by Grace McGuell, Nacelle Patel, Trey Robertson, and Sebastian Churian, all members, again, from Maritime Security Center, Stevens Institute of Technology. So the judges uh, rated those three, again, not in any particular order at the moment, um, as, as the top uh, among all submittals. But... There were so many good presentations um, that we saw that the judges sort of argued and advocated for um, essentially giving some uh, call out and honorable mention to two other posters that, that I want to call out as being quite worth uh, your effort of reviewing them and uh, a great credit to the students and the professors who mentored them. So they are Institutionalizing Resilience, Insights from Assessment Initiatives at Seaports, uh, submitted by Ellis Kalajian at the University of Rhode Island, and Erosion of Port Operations, the Impact of Coastal Wetland Resilience on the Maritime Industry in Rhode Island, submitted by Cadet Madeline Collar and Cadet Anna Kemble Cook of the United States Coast Guard Academy. Uh, so those last two were our honorable mentions, and I'll give it back to Sean, uh, for the presentations. Thanks, sir. Uh, in today's panel, uh, we will hear presentations from the top three contestants. Each of them will be allotted 10 minutes to present their research, during which time their research poster will be displayed on your computer screens. Following all three presentations, we will open the floor to a short question and answer session from the audience. In order to preclude talking over each other, please take this time to mute your microphones and submit any questions you may have using the Microsoft Teams chat board. Uh, may I have the first poster displayed, please? So it's my pleasure to introduce Liam Brew and team members Logan Drazovich and Susan Wetzel from the Stevens Institute of Technology, speaking on 
Advancing the State of Maritime Security Cybersecurity Guidelines. Hi, thanks so much for uh, having us. And this has been uh, a great conference and we really enjoyed all, all the uh, various events and I'm looking forward to presenting uh, our poster to you guys today. So um, we'll be talking about advancing the state of maritime cybersecurity guidelines. My name is Logan Drazovich. Um, I conducted this research alongside Liam Brew and our uh, faculty advisor, Professor Suzanne Wetzel, and we're all from the Stevens Institute of Technology. So the core problem that we wanted to look at with, uh, with this poster is we believe that the current state of maritime cybersecurity guidelines don't provide a holistic set of recommendations for um, cybersecurity for ship owners, um, operators, and designers. Now, we think that cybersecurity guidelines are critically important to any industry. They sort of serve as a, a uh, proven and agreed upon set of standards that, that can be referred back to by all members of, of an industry and really understood to, um, you know, as, as a place for, for solid information so that you can have, uh, you know, some, some level of cyber safety on board, on board a ship. So this, um, this poster really contributes two primary things. First, we did analysis of current guidelines. We went through and found what we thought were sort of the most important guidelines in the industry. We read them, we found out what they, what they contributed, what they, what they omitted, um, sort of what their shortcomings were and, and, and positives were. And that's sort of the middle part of our, of our poster, if you're looking at it, those, those two charts. Um, then from that, we, we developed sort of five key takeaways we use those takeaways to then propose um, a framework for what an improved set of guidelines could look like. So I'll walk you through each of those step by step, sort of explain what we did and, and what our findings were. So starting with uh, our analysis of current guidelines, we pulled guidelines from a variety of um, a variety of industries. So we have uh, government guidelines from organizations like NIST. Um, uh, we have industry organizations like. Uh, BIMCO, CLIA, the IMO, and we also have a bunch of classification societies. We found that um, many of them have published some sort of maritime cybersecurity guideline. Um, so we took all of these, we read through them, um, and, 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 and kind of made some, some points as to what, um, what we thought they, they added, and then we also ranked them on level of depth. This is something that we did uh, determine ourselves, um, when, um, just sort of how much detail they went to, how much uh, you would be able to, if you were a, a ship owner or, or operator, how much um, information you're really going to be able to get out of them that's new and unique to, um, to those guidelines. So now we'll go through our, our takeaways and, and um, sort of let you know what, what we found from, from doing this. So we found that in aggregate, all of these guidelines do cover most of the topics that we think need to be covered in a set of maritime cybersecurity guidelines. They um, you know, there's, but the problem that we saw is that many of them, or they, no single document, excuse me, covered all of these topics. So, um, for example, NIST has a lot of great information on general, um, general critical infrastructure security. And that's very helpful. It's proven. It's industry proven. It's, um, but the problem is that it's industry agnostic. It doesn't have uh, recommendations unique to the maritime industry in it. Um, Bureau Veritas and their guidelines has some very good information regarding um, network architecture and how you want to uh, have your network set up. But then they don't have any information on, on operational suggestions of, of how you, um, how, you know, if you're, if you're operating the ship, how you should be practicing cyber safety day in and day out. So th there's sort of no one place for, for people to go to get that information. And what this means, if you're a user of the guidelines, is you're referring to multiple sets of guidelines. You don't know what parts to take from where what parts are, are better for different things and, and things like that. So we definitely view this as, as a major shortcoming, as a primary shortcoming overall of, um, of, a, of current guidelines. The next point is that many of the recommendations are adapted from other industries. I mentioned that we included two NIST guidelines in here. You know, these are industry agnostic um, for, for critical infrastructure in general. Now, that's great in the sense that there's a lot of things the maritime industry can learn from other industries. Um, and having that industry agnostic information is, is valuable. But the operating environment of a ship is, is far different than something like a, a electrical grid or a water treatment facility or something like that. And so you need to have specialized recommendations that, that account for the operating environment that a ship is in. The next thing that we found is that many of them lack any form of justification. There's no references off to um, academic research or other government documents or other sort of proven places where you can, um, where you know, as a user of the guidelines, you can say, well, 
I see why this this system is adequate for this reason or something like that. That's just completely missing in, in, in many of these. And the other piece of that is it doesn't give you a place if you are a user of these guidelines to gain more detail. If you are you know, going through a, a, a network architecture and you want to figure out a little more detail on how that should work, well, there's no place for the guidelines saying, hey, go look at this academic paper that, that looks at ICS architecture in that way. And so that, that's critically important. And that sort of brings me to our, our next um, takeaway, which is the, they generally lack detail. They don't have the level of detail necessary to make plans off of, to set protocols. Um, they just kind of serve as a starting point, which is valuable, but we would like to see more detail in them so that you can really use them um, as core documents um, uh, when you when you are uh, making plans and, and setting protocols and things of that nature. And then lastly, we find that they're generally not well updated. Um, they, you, we've listed the dates on the poster. You can see that some of these are two, three, even five years old. And with the rate of change in in the maritime industry and in, in cybersecurity specifically, it's critically important that these are updated to account for the latest threat environment um, and, and constantly have, have uh, the, the most up-to-date information in them. So we took these, these five takeaways and we proposed a framework what an improved set of guidelines would look like. So I'll talk about that a bit now. So we think that there's sort of three sections that are necessary in an improved framework. The first one is a set of um, ship design principles. So this is things like laying out how the, the system of systems um, will work. So how your IT and OT network should be separated, if they should have any level of interaction, what that should look like, um, the equipment that you're including in, in your ship, what are things that you need to consider in that, the supply chain considerations, the, the vendor considerations, all of those sorts of things um, need to be laid out very well. So for a ship designer um, or somebody starting at this in the beginning phase of, uh, of the process has a place to, to find that information. The next is a set of managerial and operational best practices. So this is really for um, you know, people who are out on a, on a ship or the ship owner. So it should set cyber responsibilities and a cyber chain of command so that you know for all the stakeholders involved who's responsible for different pieces, um, who's responsible for updating equipment and what that process should look like, when should updates be applied to equipment, and what is the vetting process for that. Um, so things of that nature would be under, under there. And then lastly, uh, a set of uh, risk assessment uh, framework and then a, a mitigation, some mitigation recommendations and resiliency plan. So the risk assessment should be a way to comprehensively quantify the current risk level of a certain system. So, um, and then once you have that, that sort of quantified risk, have some recommendations on, on common ways that, that, that risk can be reduced. Um, and then you should be able to then reapply the uh, risk assessment framework and see a quantitative decrease in risk. Um, and then on top of that, you need to have some sort of a resiliency plan. So if there is a cyber event that happens, you can respond to it and know what exactly you should do in response and how to uh, then progress in as safe a way as possible following a, a cyber event. So now we, we also have sort of three recommendations based off of our takeaways that apply to the whole paper. So this is um, the first one being that it just needs to be detailed enough so that decision makers can use it to make decisions. They don't, it's not just a starting point. It is a place for them to go and uh, you know, they have enough information there to really know um, about the topic and make some decisions on, on that topic. The second one is that they need to have references and, and have a grounding in research. So this is to, this, to the detail point, have a place of, of where somebody could go get more detail or pointing to where you got that information in the first place. Um, and then also just know that what you're saying is adequate and it's going to get the job done because you have resources um, backing you up on that. And then lastly, there needs to be um, uh, there needs to be a commitment to regular updates. Um, you know, you need to have some sort of plan set out for how that's going to be, how the guidelines will be regularly updated on a known frequency. That way you're incorporating the latest threat environment, but also the latest needs of ship operators and owners. Um, there's constantly an, uh, desires for new features um, involving technology, and you need to incorporate that in so that the users of the guidelines know that they're getting the most up-to-date and, and best information at any given time. So that's really what we see as what an improved set of guidelines would look like at a high level um, based on our analysis of, of, of the current guidelines um, that, that we looked at.
So, um, yeah, that's, uh, I'd love to hear any questions or comments that you guys have, and, and hopefully uh, I can answer your questions and, and provide some more detail if you, if you need it anywhere. Thank you. Excellent presentation, and uh, look forward to those uh, that question and answer period uh, in a little bit. Right, for our you. next present, for our next presentation, it is my pleasure to introduce the team of Grace Miguel, Nasil Patel, Ray Robertson, and Sebastian Turian from the Maritime Security Center, the Stevens Institute of Technology, presenting their poster on the topic of cyber risk assessment on maritime shipping. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, it's been a pleasure and very much enjoying this conference so far. All right, so uh, good afternoon. My name is Sebastian Turian. I'm here to represent the cyber team. Uh, our research mentor is Dr. Barry Bunin. I believe he is here today. And I'm here to talk about our cyber risk assessment on maritime shipping. Now, over the summer, we learned how cyber attacks are increasing in frequency in the maritime domain and uh, a more in-depth knowledge is needed to counteract them. So the goal of this research was to identify the vulnerabilities in information technology and operation technology systems and create a risk assessment and mitigation plan for maritime facilities and vessels. Now, what was our approach for this? What was our methodology? Well, we started off with a literary search on the different cyber attacks on the maritime domain. Uh, after looking into the maritime domain and the different cyber attacks, we realized that there is a system known as the SCADA system, or the Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System, that is commonplace in not only the maritime domain, but in uh, most critical, infra uh, critical infrastructure. And in realizing this, we decided to broaden our scope to not just the maritime domain, but to research cyber attacks in all different critical infrastructure as we can find in common different, uh, or the methodology in these attacks uh, that are common throughout the different critical infrastructure. Now, after we collected the data, we organized it into a chart and we segregated it into the different critical infrastructure type that the attack was targeting. And we also realized that each attack was split into two parts. There was the entry attack, which was the entry method into the system, and then, which could be like a phishing or a software vulnerability. And then there's the main attack, which was the what damaged the system or what caused the corruption. Now, after we created this chart, we wanted to have a better understanding of the differences with the data we collected. So we used a program called Tableau to create a visualization of all the data we have. So this helps segregate the data and have a better understanding of the similarities of what were the most common cyber, or entry methods or what were the most common main attacks across all the critical infrastructure. Now, after we visualized it, we developed a risk assessment and mitigation plan for port facilities and vessels. Uh, with the risk assessment, we used a... Uh, matrix for developing the scale of it. So the vulnerability, we were to calculate it, we first created a vulnerability scale and a consequence scale. The vulnerability scale was based on the MARSEC levels, which was the Coast Guard's three-tiered threat security system, and the consequence scale was self-created. Uh, the vulnerability consequence matrix was to, used for each uh, threat that we found through our literature review, and we calculated our, the risk of each threat by summing the vulnerability and the consequence. So, for example, if we were calculating the threat of software vulnerability, the vulnerability of that would be 3, and the consequence would be 4, and the risk score would be 7. After developing risk assessment, we found that the software vulnerabilities and loss of manipulation of port OT were the highest consequence for port facilities. And interception of radio communications was, was highest for generic vessels. Mitigation plan for those were to include having a well-funded cybersecurity division of the IT department and focused in areas such as firewalls, encryptions, multi-authentication, network uh, segmentation, and much more. Another counter for the risk that we found was developing a employee educational program to help uh, everyday employees better understand different vulnerabilities that they might face during their workplace, such as uh, 
phishing attacks through emails. That was found to be a very common one. And in order to counteract that, it would be a employee educational plan that would help out with that. So in conclusion, the maritime domain has vulnerabilities in both IT and IT systems, and both must be addressed. It was found that many major attacks were preceded by an entry attack, such as phishing or social engineering. So in order to counteract, counteract these, we need to organize training uh, with the employees to better understand the different vulnerabilities in order to mitigate these attacks from happening. Thanks, Sebastian. Great job uh, by you and your team. And I look forward to hearing uh, from you all a little bit further during the, the Q&A period. Thank you. For our third and final presentation, it's my pleasure to introduce the team of Stitesh Ramnath, Sahar Maradav, Christine Wang, and Amar Bindra. These researchers are from the City College of New York and the Maritime Security Center, Stevens Institute of Technology. They will present their poster on the topic of development of a handheld sulfur emission detection device for Coast Guard Marine Inspectors. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Satesh Ramna, and I'm currently studying computer engineering at the City College of New York, and I'm a member of the software detection research team. So at the beginning of the year, the International Maritime Organization reduced the limit on sulfur content in fuel from 3.5% to 0.5%. The United States Coast Guard is responsible for enforcing this regulation and our team's goal is to create a handheld device to provide the Coast Guard with an efficient means to ensure this regulation is met. Dr. Bruce Kim was our team mentor, and he proposed nanowire sensing to create a high sensitivity device capable of detecting traces of SO2. Additionally, Dr. Barry Bunin was a co-mentor who assisted the team by providing his insight on maritime vessel structures and procedures. The sulfur detection team split into three different concentrations, and that was the chemical team, the mechanical team, and the hardware team. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Clear. My name is uh, Amar Bindra, so I'll represent the chemical team. So due to the current methods of sulfur detection, the team created a device that can replace current nano testing methods at the industrial scale and work on providing a faster, reliable, and more precise detection system. There are many industry centers that have been designed for emission testing, but none have been specifically tailored to this high-level parts per billion detection. And we have not seen such nanotechnology being used in the marine environment. So the zinc oxide nanowire array-based platform will achieve this high-level parts per billion concentration sensing and have a high specificity towards sulfur dioxide, since it's easier and cheaper in design and will be recoverable for future testing. Um, the crystal chemical structure provides a surface area along the nanowire array, as shown in the figure to the left, which increases based on the sulfur dioxide molecules that would want to maneuver their way within the nanowire channels for more coverage. This surface area is pivotal for our deposition strategy because it allows the gas molecules to be easily attracted to. Next, while we were influenced by Professor Kim's previous research, our group has determined a refined chemical bath deposition method on the left, and it, which this method is an easier and cheaper process since it'll allow us to simply dip coat a silver plating into a bath that will contain a alumina receptor. So this alumina will act like a paint, for example, and will be used to base the nanowires with. This receptor is very key to our design because it is the important piece that will chemically link our sulfur dioxide gas molecules to the nanowire. And essentially, the more coatings we have, it will have an even more spread amongst the substrate, and this will allow for peak uh, sulfur dioxide detection. Um, the benefits of this process that it allow us to control the experiment um, because specifically it'll allow us to adjust the temperature and quality of the bath. So the final step would be to configure a electrochemical reaction between our nanowire and the gas molecules. And this increase in reactivity would allow us to analy analytically 
see the concentration of SO2 that is sensed. So now that we have this novel sensor, uh, we need to find the optimal location to analyze and test the dispersion of sulfur dioxide on marine vessels. Thank you, Omar. So switching gears to the mechanical team, the primary task was with plume modeling. The ultimate goal of these plume simulations was to determine whether sulfur dioxide is feasibly measurable and where the optimum spots would be. The software used to create these simulations is called ANSYS CFX, and it is a computational fluid dynamics tool. The complexity of the simulations increased over the course of the project, beginning with very simple models and evolving into more realistic simulations, as you can see on the poster. For the ANSYS image on the left side, the parameters for this particular simulation are, first, we are assuming that the ship is stationary as it would be at any anchor or docking point. Second, the wind speed is set at four meters per second or around 7.8 knots. And it is in the direction from the stern to the bow of the ship as labeled. And third, the rate at which the sulfur dioxide is exiting the funnel is approximately one gram per second. And this value was determined through calculations by our chemical team. So these are only a few examples of how much control we are able to achieve over individual variables using the simulation software, which is, uh, of course, highly beneficial for determining the optimum implementation of our device. So going back to the image, looking closely, you can see the gray smoke descending in between the boxes representing the cargo containers. And this was extremely good news for this project because it confirmed that sulfur dioxide would be available in a location that is accessible by a person. On the right side, we see another valuable simulation image of a bird's eye view of the ship deck. The colors displayed represent the molar concentration of sulfur dioxide. And as you can see, the red areas show us the best locations to measure. So all in all, many other simulations were conducted over the course of this project in which specific variables such as wind speed or wind direction were adjusted. The behavior of sulfur dioxide was observed and it was ultimately found that greater wind speeds reduce the amount of SO2 detectable at locations and wind direction changes can create pressure areas and also greater un unpredictability. Now, all of this information doesn't help us if we don't have the correct hardware setup to make the sensor work to begin with. And with that, the hardware team will now present their portion of this project. All right, thank you, Christine. So the hardware team focused on creating the prototype platform capable of detecting sulfur dioxide emissions, processing the information, and displaying the results to the US Coast Guard inspectors. So this was done by purchasing several hardware parts where the most vital ones are a commercially available sulfur dioxide sensor, a Raspberry Pi microcomputer, LED indicators, and an LCD display. Towards the lower left of the poster, we have a high-level depiction of how the prototype was assembled. Well, the design is a solid foundation for the prototype. And in the future, the current SO2 sensor used will be replaced with the zinc oxide nanowire SO2 sensor. After conducting simulations with the current SO2 sensor, we faced issues with calibration and sensor accuracy. So we hypothesized that the zinc oxide nanowire SO2 sensor will be much simpler to calibrate since it can give a more accurate reading. Now, to ensure the resulting sensor data was processed correctly, the hardware team programmed specific scripts using the Python programming language. One main script, access the functionality of three subscripts pertaining to file creation, mathematical calculations, and LCD displaying. Finally, the prototype underwent a testing phase to validate whether the sensor can indicate traces of SO2. Indoor testing was done and showed no traces of SO2, but outdoor testing near a car exhaust yielded a result above the threshold. In the prototype testing section of the poster, the image provided shows a display message indicating a passable amount of SO2 and a green LED. So to conclude, um, the current procedures that right now involve testing for sulfur content in vessels are either used in the industrial uh, base sensing or their hands-on diesel testing methods. And this is placing us at a pretty big disadvantage uh, with, you know, foreign commerce and costly environmental impacts. 
So using our nanowire platform will provide a faster and more recoverable sensing method, but importantly, we'll put our Coast Guard at the advantage to detect sulfur content more accurately and avoid corruption with other uh, uh, global uh, vessels. Um, accuracy and nano sensing are key towards securing our borders from the vessels that do not meet the IMO's in environmental standards. In the end, we would love to thank the SRI and MSC faculty for all their continued support and mentorship through this summer's research program. We look forward for the future success of this project. Thank you. Great job, and thanks to the entire team for that wonderful presentation. Uh, as discussed, uh, we would like to take a few minutes to uh, support uh, a short question and answer period. And I'd like to ask for uh, support from uh, Drew and Andrea. So uh, folks, you can type in in the chat room uh, a question for one of our three teams, uh, or if you raise your hand or come on up the, uh, the screen, uh, and I'll just ask my, uh, my teammates to help us out to identify folks that would like to ask a question. And of course, we can always default the first question to our great friend, and supporter, Dr. Joe Dorenzo. No question, Sean, just that they did an exceptional job. They really did, Joe. So I have a question for the uh, the team that just presented on the uh, uh, on the detecting device. And that is, have, have you considered the possibility of putting your sensor on a drone so that you can get it to certain locations uh, with a lot more safety uh, without having to have folks, you know, climb up on stacks or on top of cargo containers. Um, but then obviously you'd have some issue with the, the drone, you know, giving some turbulence to the air. So just, just throwing that out as a possibility. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So one of the things that we did is we had to talk to some of the stakeholders and possible users, which is going to be the United States Coast Guard. And one of the things that they said that they would not do is fly drones because that would require more funding and more training for the inspectors, which they were not willing to do. This was originally our first idea when we started this project, but because of obviously the stakeholder would decide how the device would ultimately be used, we had to abandon the idea and go to a handheld device. Um, and considering the drones, there have been um, two successful drones like in research, uh, they have done well in detecting sulfur emissions, but their only weak point was their sensor. And our sensor will go way beyond in sensing, uh, you know, sulfur dioxide at that level that they have not done yet. Uh, this is Beth Austin DeFerris uh, from the Maritime Security Center. I had a, a question for Logan. Um, Logan, is your uh, paper available and where can we find it? Um, so right now our, our research is just um, in the poster that uh, that we presented. We, we're looking to uh, get that um, into sort of a paper format in a bit more detail uh, going forward. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Look forward to, to seeing that in publication. Outstanding work. Thank you. I just would like to make a general comment about um, our student teams that um, the MSC students that presented were part of a virtual summer research program this past summer. So um, their outcomes were quite spectacular for a 10 week virtual program. And uh, we couldn't be more proud of their efforts. So they came together as teams from very different parts of the country. So for example, uh, Christine from the sulfur detection team was in Utah, and a majority of her other teammates were, were here on the East Coast. So um, not only were they virtual, but they were working against time zones. So how they came together and what they produced was just quite extraordinary. And um, so just a plug for that, and also the student teams were predominantly undergraduate students, which really goes to show the level of talent that we have out there and um, how the investments uh, in our educational programs through the Centers of Excellence are so vital and so important. So that's my plug and just a, a general uh, voice of uh, pride for our student teams. So thank you.
Uh, what a wonderful comment. Thanks for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, uh, and not lost on me uh, and uh, everybody I'm sure that's been participating is uh, that this has become a, a somewhat new normal with the virtual symposiums uh, or symposia. Uh, I was describing to Dr. Joe, this is my uh, third event in a month. And so uh, hats off uh, to all the mentors, uh, professors, and the uh, undergraduate and graduate students for coming together uh, during uh, COVID-19 uh, and, uh, uh, and, and finding a way to make this work. Uh, I'll ask both of the cyber teams and we'll uh, shift to uh, Logan's team, uh, I believe, uh, first. Um, in looking at something like the, the pandemic, do you see uh, any parallels from a black swan perspective uh, with regard to maritime cybersecurity and the importance uh, of guidelines of getting ahead. And, and I'll ask the same uh, questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that having sort of that, that baseline of, of cybersecurity expectations um, is, is critically important, and particularly in something like, um, like the pandemic. I mean, early on when, when things were really up in the air and, and changing constantly, um, having that sort of baseline document that anybody can refer to. And if you are bringing, you know, an older ship that's not as updated back into service for, for a particular reason because of it, how you're making sure that you're, um, you know, having, having sort of the standards to assess the risk of that and then, um, and then how, to, how to mitigate that risk is critically important. So, yeah, I think that standards um, and on a black swan event like, like COVID-19 are very, very important. Um, and then having that kind of agreed upon core document can be so helpful. So that's not a concern and you're more concerned with, with the direct impacts of, of the Black Swan event. Thanks, Logan. Uh, Sebastian, anything else that you and your team would like to share? Well, looking at with the, what the coronavirus has done with society now, it's almost everyone is online now. So we're more so susceptible to cyber attacks than ever before as we have more of an online presence in our everyday. So just being aware of the different vulnerabilities online will greatly help uh, mitigate any attacks that can occur. And it's even more prevalent in this Black Swan event that we find ourselves in now. So finally, uh, we'll present our awards. Uh, as you know, in something like this, uh, the evaluations and uh, the opportunity to listen critically to the presentations uh, really defines a, a wonderful path forward uh, and is encouraging uh, so that we all understand uh, the strength of our future that lies with these students. So there is no third place uh, for second place with a score of 23 out of 25 possible points. Uh, it's awarded to cyber risk assessment on maritime shipping. Again, submitted by the team of Grace Miguel, Ms. Seal Patel, Trey Robertson, and Sebastian Churian from the Maritime Security Center, Stevens Institute of Technology. And yeah, please uh, uh, take the time for a virtual round of applause. Well done. First place is a tie. Uh, both projects were awarded 24 of 25 possible points. Uh, first place in the 2020 Maritime Risk Symposium Research Poster Competition is awarded to co-winners. Development of a handheld sulfur emission and detection device for Coast Guard Marine Inspectors, again submitted by the team of Satesh Ramnath, Edhard Maradov, Christine Wang, and Amar Bindra from the City College of New York and the Maritime Security Center, Stevens Institute of Technology and Advancing the State of Maritime Security Guidelines, submitted by the team of Liam Drew, Drew I'm sorry, Logan Drazovich, and Suzanne Wetzel from the Stevens Institute of Technology. Round of applause, please. <laughs> to these students and uh, students, certificates of award will be sent to you and your university in the following days. On behalf, of the 2020 Maritime Risk Symposium, we thank you for your time and attention and commend all participants on their research and presentations in this year's competition. Thanks and well done, everyone. Andrea, thank back you. over to you, or Drew. Nothing else to add. Thank you all very much. I just wanna say thank you to everyone, especially the students. Um, I, 
You know, it's interesting. Um, we really wanted to have um, high student turnout for this event. And I think making it virtual actually helped that because a lot of students aren't able to travel due to class schedule and funding and such. So I just am so excited to have um, so much participation. Um, I think what we're going to do, Joe, did you have something you wanted to say? I see you're unmuted. No, just, uh, I just wanted to say that this quadrupled the number of previous posters that we had in any uh, uh, former one. I know we've got Scott Blau, who was the 2017 chair, and uh, Eric Johansson on the line, and uh, we blew the doors off it this year. And thank you so much to, uh, to Drew and to Sean for emceeing this outstanding work. Looking forward to the final panel.